uh, that there are now recognized archaeological sites which involve huge amounts of workmanship that are as old as the Sphinx. And I wonder if some other sites have been misinterpreted, if sites have, are multi-layered, that many different cultures have been involved in them, and archaeology is perhaps making the mistake of just dating them to the most recent culture that was present. This is Baalbek uh, in the Lebanon, um, and uh, undoubtedly a Roman temple here. Uh, temple of Jupiter that I'm sitting in, and, and behind it the, uh, the Temple of Bacchus, dedicated to wine. Those Romans knew how to have fun. Um, a Roman site for sure, but what about this bizarre enclosure wall that surrounds it, which is totally separate from the Temple of Jupiter? What's this about? These, this is called the Trilithon. Each of these three blocks weighs 900 tons, 900 tons. And it's extraordinary the way they're built into a wall and raised 30 feet above the ground like this, a wall, the provenance for which has not been established by archaeology. Just another look, and I'm in the picture for, for scale at the, at the Trilithon. So uh, nearby is the quarry. And the quarry contains a number of very large blocks that were never transported from the quarry site. Now, the one I'm standing on weighs a thousand tons, hundred tons more than the ones in that wall. And that one over there, on the other side of the road, unfortunately used now as a rubbish tip, weighs 1,200 tons. And the one here in the, that I'm standing on here, which is only recently excavated, turns out to weigh 1,400 tons. Why only recently excavated? Because the whole site was covered in sedimentation. Um, what archaeologists say, and it still amuses me, of course the Romans did everything, they found they could move 900 ton blocks, but 1,000 tons was too much for them. So they couldn't move them. So they just left them in the quarry. In my view, that's a very un-Roman thing to do. The Romans were very practical people. Okay, let's say they couldn't move a thousand tons, but having gone to all the work of creating huge megaliths like this, they wouldn't have wasted them. They'd have sliced them up like loaves of bread and used the already shaped blocks in other constructions. The fact that they didn't do that, that these are still there, suggests to me the whole site was covered during Roman times. And it's only in more recent times that it's been excavated and revealed. So in this short piece, there's a lot to unpack. Um, but let's begin with the bizarre enclosure wall that surrounds talking about the temple of, that surrounds it and is totally separate from the temple of jupiter so again I, we've created a separation and that is part of a point to create like the question separation therefore is going to try to insert this as uh cat, you know the cataclysm apocalypse but here are an older picture of a trial of fond walls and again you can see the breach which is an important feature and the one two and three trial of fond stones to highlight there and the breach and we're standing directly above it so if you know if you'd visited the site you would be able to spot this you know where you are by this these other walls that are here here are some photos links in the description of course is uh, some great uh, but we see the trilophon wall and the scaffold and from the other side and the scaffold and it goes into the breach there so that scaffolding leads us right into here. Just to point that out. Okay, now we come to an aerial view. Is the columns of the Temple of Jupiter, Temple of Bacchus, much more complete. And there we have the trilophons. And we can see the breach, but also remember this column, large column piece, which is there, right on the breach. And there we have Graham Hancock. You can see that he's lined up with this column of the temple of jupiter and which is pretty much lined up with the temple of bacchus behind it so we get a very good idea of where his location is so he's somewhere right in here which is less than 50 meters from this breach in the trilophon okay so we know where he is now let's look aerial view of the Baalbek complex which includes other temples it's not just the temple of jupiter so Temple of Bacchus, and there we see the six columns and the perimeter of the Temple of Jupiter. Now it's the bizarre wall which is totally separate from the Temple of Jupiter. Well, so we've located, you know, he was in line with this side and aligned with the Temple of Bacchus. So in this area, the wall breach is here, that breach is, uh, sits right on top of the trilophons by the power of Google we go down and Temple of Jupiter he was sitting somewhere just over here just where these other uh, stones are just behind those large column drums now we'll come back to this later, but this is the part of a reconstruction, uh, probably you know during the um, well after the, during or after the Crusader period. You can even see they've put these little slits. So this is just you know stones thrown up together, 
this place was built, used as a fortress, even got the little like battlements. And Temple of Jupiter, he was aligned along there, so 50 metres away. We can use this column also as a reference, but there is the breach with the scaffold. There is standing right on top of a trilophon. So this trilof bizarre wall is totally separate from the Temple of Jupiter. How so? And again, he was just that. And even you see the older photos that this breach was available. You could see it from the outside, so it's very hard to explain. Well, maybe you know, 20 years ago it was a little bit buried over, but you could, you know, by looking at those photos, being there at the, t or being there in location, you would sit under the trilophon, you would see this breach. And so, how how is it totally separate? So, if it, we'll get to the bizarre, you know, the bizarre wall, which now separates it. But it literally says totally separate from the temple of Jupiter. Now, that you know, depending on definitions, that may be true. But the temple of Jupiter is part of the larger complex. It is not a standalone thing. So to say that this is totally separate is totally incorrect. Um, Maybe totally separate. Because you could say, well, this, you know, this was the boundary. This large block was the boundary of a temple of Jupiter. Yeah, but now we have wordplay going on, and he's going to create further, you know, separation. Therefore, and then, the, you know, and then we'll, we'll come to that. But so it's just not true. It's uh, false. Now, if you've ever seen like the Brian Foster um, Bright Insight videos in the past, I don't know what they've, maybe they've changed. No, well, I know Brian Foster hasn't, but. Uh, this, you know, crude Roman wall is, you know, it was a crude, we'll, we'll see better photos of it, but this was part of, you know, and like made into battlements uh, for the later period because this part of the world has always been very important in trade. It's basically the first watering point when you come across the desert towards the coast. And so, yeah, it's just not true. The bizarre enclosure wall that surrounds it and is totally separate from the Temple of Jupiter world Temple of Jupiter part of the complex, so it's not totally separate, but also the, the claim of bizarre sort of is to separate it, like totally separate, we have the same. He's a great, he's awesome at his rhetoric, I've got to give that to him, all right. So there we have the complex aerial view, so Temple of Bacchus, let's look at bizarre enclosure walls, podiums, now also there we have the uh, tr trilophon or the, the enclosure wall, now this enclosure wall is part of the wider complex to which the Temple of Jupiter is just one piece. Now, now, Temple of Bacchus, let's look at an older photo. Uh, and so again this place was used and reused and occupied and uh, occupied by others, fortress for a long time, again very important trading pla uh, base, watering station on the edge of a desert for caravans coming towards the coast, border of the, well anyway now you note know, these walls in the old photo are there, and we'll notice this piece here how all this you know, dirt in the walls here, which are come right up to the top to the base of the columns. So we go back, and so this was buried and you know, up, up until to the base of the podium that's what you know, the platform at the bottom. Uh, some will still. Amongst the lost high tech community, will still insist that this the Romans couldn't have done this because there are megalithic aspects to uh, across this place. But Corinthian columns, the Roman design features, are very Roman. Separate them from Greek temples forever. So Greek temples do look very similar, but there are enough differences in a Roman temple so you could tell them apart. So okay, it's, it's a all from a different angle we see there. Okay, notice these this block, this feature. This is going to be an important piece. So compare, we see, and that's the area we're looking at, the podium, as it's called. And notice it's got this flare. Flares in, flares out. Very common 
a standard feature of Roman temples is to have this uh, temple of Portunus in Rome. Same sort of feature we see. Again, very Roman. Temple of Nimes in France. Same thing. Temple at Ghani in Armenia. Uh, like total reconstruction from there, but the podium did survive. And we look at the podium, and it has, again, that Roman podium design. Temple of uh, Artemis at Jeresh in Jordan, so like, like Palmyra, Baalbek and Jeresh were on the border, tra even up, well, up until the modern age when trade caravans were coming through these were watering stations and, and I suppose tax points as well as people left the desert and come towards the coast and we have that same feature there. So this is just a standard, you could countless examples of it, this is a standard feature which brings us back to the bazaar wall and the trilophons. Well, what we have is, well, we have a podium thing now. Also note the different styles of uh, work there. The, you know, the older, it's like you know, it's under the trilophon, so it's got to, it has to be older. Then we have this later work, which again, different style now. We have dressing around the blocks. And then we have this w wall, which is just rubble, uh, just, blocks thrown up to to create a wall and that's right next to that breach we saw earlier but the trilophons and the blocks so three trilophons and seven of those blocks underneath all they're showing the base of that roman design all right it's from the side we see the same thing so this is the podium which surrounds the temple Temple of Jupiter is not separate from the complex and neither is it separate from this enclosure wall. I'll link this video in the description. Massive stone block found in Baalbek Quarry, Marguerite von Ys interview. They've dug deep down and they found Greek and earlier inside. You know, so, that, you know, to say it's not provenanced at all, well, maybe an exact block, but to say, like, not provenanced that this wall is of that time, well, that's... A, uh, there is zero evidence to say that it is pre-cataclysmic, let's put it that way, and there is a lot of evidence to say that it's Roman or of that era. Because when you say Roman, it's not like you know people of Rome. The Roman Empire was a big, sprawling empire with all sorts of cultures and people in there. Uh, people say, oh, Baalbek is a backwater so far away from Rome. Well, and actually, that part of the world was much more sophisticated than than Rome and, and that part was. So these were... Yeah. Okay, I'll link this description as well. Mystery of the Great uh, Megaliths, Baalbek Without Aliens by Scientists Against Myth. I show all, all these little details and, and put them into context and this, of the archaeologists, there's no provenance and all these types of things in there. But So trilophons, and I mentioned, I showed a bit earlier, but that very rough wall at the top, you can see it's just you know other pieces that have been put together, and you even got this uh, like is it called the arrow slits or the battlement design as well. All right, so the first claim the bizarre wall where we're, you know you've setting up something there, and then you have totally separate. So he's open with this statement, which creates you know starts creating you know the doubt, the separation, and are oh, therefore, uh, and then you look okay. We'll go to the next parts. Each of these three blocks weighs 900 tons, 900 tons. And it's extraordinary the way they're built into a wall and raised 30 feet above the ground like this, a wall, the provenance for which has not been established by archaeology. Just At this point, he just said raised 30 feet into the ground. Well, well yes, but what is exact, to be fair to him, what does that exactly mean? Uh, now, maybe he's not implying exactly that in this particular talk, lecture that he's giving, but many people take it to mean that they were lifted 30 feet into the ground. Certainly other very popular YouTube people say it and it's seen, you see it in the comments all the time. So it is certainly an impression that a lot of people have. Now, here's the quarry. Now, another thing that he didn't, Graham Hancock didn't say it in this particular video, and there might be a position he no longer holds, but he also, you'll hear, how were they lifted uphill? And it's like, oh, they were uphill from the quarry. Well, 
you can see in the background there's a temple of Bacchus and temple of Jupiter in the background and already from there you can see it's not uphill it's not mountainous and these other you know um, hyperbolic statements that are made about it now there's the temple itself so we see what we're looking at and the trilophons are underneath both of those layers uh, and the self you can get the measurements of there working on limestone you know cube per cubic meter even at the heavier scale well really they'd be looking at 750 to 800 tons not 900 and it is a difference because we'll see in a moment anyway so basically the trilophons are at level ground with the quarry itself um, the stones were moved uphill where you can get there are even older surveys in this I'm just using Google Earth which gives you elevations there's a temple where we can see well that's where the trilophons are here's the quarry site on the lower part of the lowest part of the quarry where it bowls down is where those large unfinished stones are and we get an idea of the elevation a straight line it's um, 800 meters half a mile as the crow flies and again the quarry is the rest of the quarry is higher so it's equal to or in some parts higher than this so much stone has been removed from there like they focus on the few unfinished stones there but jesus you know how much has been moved like this place has been emptied out so it's okay we'll get to that but the quarry as the crow flies about 800 meters half a mile but where the current road extends where still the road is now and you follow the contours of the land that blue line just follow the natural contours and how did they raise it 30 now Romans built excellent roads the rampant Masada will come to that but so at the most the elevation to get you know to raise these 30 feet would be just to follow the contour and you know and, and it's less than one degree up to maybe 1.2 degrees at the very maximum so essentially it's across flat land to raise them the 30 feet to get them in that position now he's going to talk about the position of what the archaeologists are and what they say well uh, here's one of the proposed ideas now within the existing technology of the time and I'm just going to state this as a fact again um, without doubt the Romans knew about force multipliers and mechanical advantage prior to that people were making sail ships which re require force multipliers and mechanical advantage to operate the Romans didn't invent sail uh, it's just that we have the documents which are very clear and the, de the depictions and the documents which describe that they had this technology even the Roman, for instance, Vitruvius describes it. All cranes are developed from sailing ship technology, and so this is in, you know raised. They didn't raise them thirty feet. They followed the contours. You know, never have to. You know, you once you got them on the rollers, you don't want to lift these things, and that's how they brought them in place. Now, what's the concept? Well, they buried on the outside, so you've got you know you know you just bring them across level land the whole time across with rollers absolutely the um, potential is there now is there example well the Roman siege at Masada they built an absolutely giant ramp to for a you know, for some small amount of rebels now for a big massive temple complex well that's one descript that's one possible way to do it and this concept of burying to build and you know, lifting the ground level as you build is also mentioned in Vitruvius. They, for instance, uh, the Greek, he described how they buried layers and then they built the columns up and then they put the massive uh, pediment on top of the temple by burying it and then you just dig it out. So massive earthworks, people, you know, all people are basically, basically been doing massive earthworks in some scale or another. So, and also in regards to, well, how did they get the rollers out? Well, you really only have to lift one side at a time. The Roman lifting towers to bring in the 400 ton obelisks, well, you only need to build, you could build one on either side to lift it deadlift straight up, or you just lift one side, get the rollers out there, then you lift the other side and you get the rollers out there underneath. So with existing technology and materials, you just upscale it. Another thing is, well, you can't upscale, yes, you absolutely, it's not a curve. If I can lift one tonne, well, I need twice the effort to get two ton, twice the effort to get four ton. It's not a curve of difficulty. It's a 45, you know, double the weight, double the, the energy. There's not a magical line where all of a sudden weight weighs more than 
half of it's it's just it's, it's a silly thing so uh, would the wooden crawl, ro- ro- rollers get crushed to be fair Graham Hancock might have abandoned this but you still see very you know on the Rogan pro- po- podcast and stuff like that people are still saying even 70 tons would get crushed under the rolls this is absolutely absurd um, you know it's just made up because you can look freely available to get the information look at the examples of when they're moving giant ships how did they do it? Well, they used to do it on rollers. They put scaffolding under to support absolutely massive weight. So, uh, yeah, were they raised 30 feet? Well, yes, they were raised 30 feet, but it's not lifted. Gentle ramp. So uh, nearby is the quarry. And the quarry contains a number of very large blocks that were never transported from the quarry site. Now, the one I'm standing on weighs 1,000 tonnes, 100 tonnes more than the ones in that wall. And that one over there, on the other side of the road, unfortunately used now as a rubbish tip, weighs 1,200 tonnes. And the one here, in the, that I'm standing on here, which is only recently excavated, turns out to weigh 1,400 tonnes. Why only recently excavated? Because the whole site was covered in sedimentation. Um, what archaeologists say, and it still amuses me, of course the Romans did everything, they found they could move 900 tonne blocks, but 1,000 tonnes was too much for them. So they couldn't move them. So they just left them in the quarry. In my view, that's a very un-Roman thing to do. The Romans were very practical people. Okay, let's say they couldn't move a thousand tons, but having gone to all the work of creating huge megaliths like this, they wouldn't have wasted them. They'd have sliced them up like loaves of bread and used the already shaped blocks in other constructions. The fact that they didn't do that, that these are still there, suggests to me the whole site was covered during Roman times, and it's only in more recent times that it's been excavated and revealed. Here we come to the issue of the quarry. Now, this is the most famous of the massive stones in the Baalbek quarry, the unfinished stones, which are all connected to the earth. So they wasn't moved. We don't really need to explain it. But in regards to the uh, comments that Graham Hancock made, that these cannot be, you know, that the sediment, firstly it's in a bowl, so the sediment, you know, rolls in there, especially over 2,000 years and rain is, it's on the East Mediterranean coast, which is not exactly a desert area. There's, you know, a lot of rain, you know, it's part of a fertile crescent. Uh, here we see the stone before it was excavate and usually the photos are from this side but the older photo on the uh, left also gives you an idea that this pit was uh, still a little bit empty now the Romans were practical people if they didn't use this large stone they would have cut it up into pieces well later cultures were also practical people who would have cut that up so that argument on its on, a, on its own doesn't really stand not in my opinion now where we see that same stone and buried and what's more important we see this area or get a hint that this area before it's been excavated excavated now we see that stone again you can see the stain where it's been dug out and more importantly is to look at these areas behind there and now there you see the stone so that's the end of the stone with the stain mark and we see these large blocks there so that was put in well why if the romans were practical and they would not not have ever left a you know a stone there's a lot of stone you know still there to be removed you see the larger quarry they've removed a massive amount of stone and later because pe- later people as well the quarry also runs up the hill so it's a huge amount's been moved, but now we get that um, Google Street View, and you can see that area, and and well, you know. So then the argument be, well, that can't be a Roman quarry either, because you know of the blocks. Uh, now the same point is one of the other, which he showed one of the other large monoliths that's not too far away. Um, also, like just at the top of the screen, if you go a bit further, there's a rock wall there which has been worked. It's you know, it's not carved out as a monolith, but blocks have been cut out of it. And then we have, well, the Romans would have started cutting up these stones. Well, let's assume that this kind of, we shouldn't assume, but possibly it was the Romans who did actually start cutting out this stone as well. Maybe it was the later people, but still uh, that stones would not be left, you know, they, the Romans wouldn't go to all the effort of, or Roman era people wouldn't go to all the effort of, making a, a large rectangular block limestone let's be, you know, be blunt about it uh well okay here's another roman quarry where work was started but it wasn't finished now there are so many around the world you know it's sort of that they wouldn't start carving block taking out a block and that other practical people wouldn't do the same it's uh, uh, mount ochi in turkey so these are limestone just like the bulb but these are columns which you know, they may not be as large, in, these are still massive columns, but there's a lot of effort to go making columns than what there is to you know, using a plumb line and a string line to make out regular blocks. 
Now, the practical people of that era certainly would not have left columns up there, but yes, you know, there they are. Alexandria Trellis. These are granite columns, you know, and they're not little teeny tiny little things either. These were left. It's not practical to move things that you don't need to move anymore. Also, there could be a local revolt. There's a war that happens which drains your workers. The king dies and his vanity projects. People are, you know, let's not spend any more money on building this temple. Uh, Natural history by Pliny is an interesting passage where he talks about the, you know, you know, that the disdain that he had for these leaders who spent so much money making columns and tra and doing it for these things. So it's, um, you know, there are a variety of reasons that could go into the the reasons behind why you would stop a project and you know it is pr it's more practical to let's just stop doing it and you know move on we don't need these things now could be again plague or war or all, all sorts of other things come in one's claudianus in egypt which is a as far as the egyptian quarries go it's actually you know it sort of is up high and, and a difficult position and um very unique type of stone as well and well this is a roman quarry you know, there's inscriptions and it's the writings there. Uh, we even, this was almost certainly going to go to the Pantheon, but the large column broke, and there are others in there as well. So, if, if the Roman were practical people, why wouldn't they cut this up into smaller column sections and move it on? So, again, he's created this firstly the bizarre wall that doesn't belong belong there. The, uh, it's not connected, yet it is. And then the Romans are practical, they would never leave these things here, therefore, and the, and the quarry's been filled in with sediment and the Romans would never leave a... I'm sure they're practical and they would cut them up. Well, this is, you know, he's, he, he, as with all other sites, he's trying to get everything to be 12,000 BC and he mocks the archaeologists, they say, well, everything's Roman. Well, buddy, everything, you're trying to get everything into, you know, therefore, younger Dryas, Skobleki Tepe, so it's a bit rich you know of, of that as well um and he's ignoring the evidence and if you put all these things in context so when he said he's very eloquent he's got his you know he know he's a great public speaker all the little psychological tricks he gets to get this, the audience on side as well he's a master at that but the you know if you leave out you know the archaeologists say this and you know oh, stupid archaeologists and well what do they actually say you know and uh then or you know, create a problem which doesn't exist create put something out of context and once you can create a question then it's oh well it's reasonable to think that you know everything's 12 feet like why is everything everything that's big is oh that's got to be you know megalithic that has to be this lost civilization now if you're looking for evidence for these things i can't you know Everyone wants to find something new. Every, you know, we want to do, but to do it in such a manner that the lost ancient high technology Graham Hancock crowd do, I have to, is very dishonest. And then they say, well, oh, we're you know we're being suppressed and we're being harassed and all. But that's what they've been doing for ages. And now that they get a little bit of pushback, they're getting all precious about it. Sorry, darling, you know, sorry, you, you can't go around slapping people and then when you get slapped back, start to cry. It is, it is the bitchiest little thing to fucking do um, going out there. But anyway, as long as you, yeah, you create problems that don't exist. Make comparisons that are always in your side on one direction, but when the same thing would happen, you know, to suit you in the other way, well, that comparison doesn't, you know, now you can use a different comparison. But uh, this Baalbek thing, this is one of the... Uh, Perennial, one of the found, you know, pardon the expression, one of the foundation stones of this thing, and again, it could be. I can't say that it isn't. Um, but what I've seen, you know, I want, you know, I'm very interested in that. But what I, it, it makes, you know, it's pooping in the punch bowl, in in that regards as well. And uh, and these people, being, you know, some people who are new to it or whatever, you know, I remember being in the early days being really. Uh, Mesmerite, obviously, oh, who would say, who would lie on the internet, who wouldn't, you know, he's so, he's got a middle class English accent, he must know what he's, he wouldn't say that without doing, you know, backup research, but then, as with so much of his alternative stuff, I find that it, it, it is a cold and it is built on cunning deceit, because it's, 
they really are ma master salesmen, I have to say, but it was beginning a journey of fact-checking certain things. I had a background, I knew a little bit about lifting and rigging, so, oh, okay, well, he got that wrong, but, you know, he, he's good-hearted. Then it's, well, this stonework thing. Well, no, you know, I learned a little bit about stonework, and it's, well, that's not true either. And then I learned a little bit more about details, Roman history, Roman architecture, and, well, that's not true either. And so um, I got it, yeah, it, it's like bizarre enclosure wall that's around totally you know i understand now how these guys can tell a great story perfect with a perfect picture but with these statements that they make you know even they can sort of weasel out of them and say well i didn't actually say that you know because it's not totally it's totally separate from the temple of jupiter well by definition you could say to get away with that but it's just not true um especially that it's been going on for years and years and years and all I can say is that, uh, yeah, that, well, what more can I, th this is a scam, you know, it, re it really is. And then if you look a little bit deeper and you see there uh, when they get recorded on more in conferences and stuff like that, what they're saying, it's really very kumbaya. I have to say cultish as well. It seems that the stone and the lifting is really just a way to get into a cult is, is yeah, it's, it's just a perfect way to describe it because, it, well, with that, I'll leave it and, and just sit with this small little four minute section. You know, he's created such a picture, and then, well, it has to be now. You know, Younger Dryas 12,000 years ago, Gobleki Tepe lost civilization. And then the next section, he does the same thing, and then the next. And this is once you see the pattern by which people like him work, you start to you realize how they operate. And they, they are excellent, excellent at the rhetoric. Geniuses, I must say, in that way. But uh, once you do fact-checking, trying to put things into context, you know, look at these... It's... They're not honest. They're not looking for truth. They're just asking questions. But hey, I'm just a normal kid, like you, except that I ask questions. And because I'm brave enough to ask questions, I come under scrutinies. Is Wendy using your lunch money to buy heroin? Probably not. But how can we know? I don't want my lunch money going to drugs. Who's taking these drugs? What would be the point? I'm asking questions.